Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our short but intense webinar about psychological safety. Uh, so we have approximately 30 minutes to uh, explore this topic today. It's a hot topic. It's a hot topic because on one hand, organizations really struggle to keep their workers engaged. And on the other hand, more specifically, they, they have trouble to, uh, to have people express their, their feelings, challenge each other, uh, leverage collective intelligence for innovation. And all these uh, limitations are already usually pretty, uh, pretty annoying. But in an age where disruptions are commonplace, everything is changing, this, uh, uh, this inability uh, becomes really dramatic, which is why we want to explore that today. We want to explore more specifically what are the leadership behaviors that help create an environment of psychological safety. And to answer these questions, we have two international speakers with us, Karen Kemmerling from uh, K2 uh, Leadership Development and Daniel Gagnon, who like me is from Agile Leader Academy. So I will let them introduce themselves very briefly and then we're going to dive right away in the topic. Karen? Yeah, so thank you, Bruno. Um, again, my name is uh, Karen Kemmerling. And just real quick, my background is um, 35 years of corporate world um, and everything from engineering to um, being the president of a financial technology company when I sort of stepped away about five years ago. And since then, I've been really into leadership development and um, psychological safety. And I'm a brain-based coach um, on that topic, as well as um, gone through a number of different certifications and so forth. But um, the most important thing really is to reflect back on the history and the work that I did in the corporate world and think about how this topic may, may have really enabled and empowered me to be probably a much better leader than, than I was. So I'm super passionate about it. So happy to be here and share some, share some real experiences. Daniel. All right. Thanks, Karen and Bruno. So I'm Daniel Daniel. Um, I've got uh, yeah almost as much experience as Karen and in, in, in the trenches of you know corporate North America. I'll say that being Canadian. Um, last twenty five years mostly concentrated on project management. Last twelve of that um, agile agile coaching organizational development. And um, after many years of working in the agility space. I came to the conclusion that there are times where I was actually creating false hope because I was working with organizations who basically said that they wanted to affect some sort of agile transformation, but the lacking ingredient I've come to discover is psychological safety and encouraging teams to think that, you know, merely bringing an agile voice of working into IT or or other you know connected areas is enough well it's not and that's why for the last two years or so much like Karen I've dedicated myself to leadership development and the creation of safe spaces for innovation and for people to thrive and that's what brings us here today so uh, we've actually sort of put together this very brief uh, presentation. Uh, as you know, it's called the top three leadership behaviors uh, to foster psychological safety. And these are three leadership behaviors. They're sort of overarching way to give you some details. They're from a number of sources, which we'll give you at the end. So without further ado, let's, um, let's move on to uh, behavior number one, basically. Behavior number one for leaders Understand that you need to, to lose the superhero cape. The superhero cape got you to where you are today. It got us all where we are today. We've all, you know, if, if we've got any kind of experience that goes back more than 10 years, 15 years, uh, we were rewarded for getting results and uh, driving ahead and all those tropes. It's the time for that has passed. We need to start um, we, what we call modeling vulnerability and, and using every every opportunity we have for that. So, and Karen, you've got some good perspectives on, as I, I just mentioned this, but our learned behaviors do make this incredibly difficult. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, so the big thing that, that if we have a brain from a brain based standpoint, we have a bias, right? We were born in a certain part of the world or country, we we're born a certain gender. Um, and we have these norms. Um, and so we've learned that, that, that leadership in a lot of ways is that superhero cape. I need to be the achiever. I need to be in the middle of everything. Um, and we've gotten rewarded for that. Um, it's also a formula for, um, having everybody have to check in with you and not necessarily bring in their best selves to work so that you are in the center. And it's a formula for disaster as far as burnout goes. And um, that's why I would say it's very hard. And this is something that you have to, to work at to, to be aware of. So. Now you make a great point there, Karen, uh, Richard Boyatis talks about the cycle of sacrifice and self renewal. And too many leaders have sacrificed and burned themselves out, laboring under this uh, misconception that the superhero cape is still a valid way of doing things. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, at the rate, uh, the complexity we're facing now, it's just no longer possible. Yeah. So the, the second sort of um, approach we'd like to give you under this overarching behavior is, well, how do you start going about losing the superhero cape? Well, one way we found is, um, you can take small steps. You're not gonna lose it all at once. And the smallest steps you can take are with one person at a time. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you bond with people uh, to ensure that you're, you're basically making sure that everyone is included and every voice is heard. Yeah, the thing with bonding, I'll just share just to build on, on what Daniel's saying here is there's there's two ways, like in theory, bonding and bridging and bonding would be related to, hey, we have something in common. So we can talk about that and we can relate to that. And that's a small step. Um, if there's a Friday afternoon club that gets together and you want to invite somebody that never wants to come. Um, maybe start smaller and include, you know, one one on one conversation with that person to, to better understand, you know, what are their interests? What are their, you know, hobbies and so forth, like as a human. Right. So this starts to develop a bond when people are very different. We develop what we call a bridge, um, which is bring your curiosity. If you're very different than me, I might be triggered, but that's an opportunity to get curious versus um create an in-group and an out-group. So these smaller steps make it easier to be part of a larger group because there's less there's less triggering and, and there's less um, sort of threat, if you will, because you have a relationship with with somebody. Absolutely. And when you've when you've done those small steps and you've created those relationships, you will then find yourself in group situations. And the other element of losing the superhero cape in group situations, you really should speak last. Um, Many of us know the theory of anchoring, right? So if a, if a leader is present in a group discussion um, and that leader speaks first, well, it kind of shuts things down a little bit for the people that are more introverted. There may be a few extroverts who would still sort of poke and challenge, but basically by speaking first, you've anchored people around your point of view and you've shut down probably 70% of what you would have otherwise gotten out of that, out of that group dynamic. So... And this is hard too, right? This goes right back to that first goal. Our learned behaviors make this hard. We're supposed to take command. We're supposed to be out there. We're supposed to be giving the orders, you know, playing the bugle, bringing the troops forward. No, no, speak last. Uh, playing the bugle, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Bugling yes. people forward. Mm -hmm. So speaking yeah, so of the... you know, that Go bugling ahead. forward, it's a self-imposed expectation, right? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, this one ties, I mean, almost back to the to the bias and the this is hard, right? So um, we've learned uh, that, you know, hey, if I'm the whatever my title is, make it up, you know, X, Y, Z, I'm the CEO, I'm the president, I'm the whatever I am, I'm the head of the software team. It's like I have a mental model of how I'm supposed to show up um, and I should know, you know, I should know the answer to X, Y, Z. And it's like that creates a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. And it also puts the team back into that space of, you know, what Daniel just said about in groups uh, speak last. If you're the leader, it's like if you're the leader and you're like, I know best, it's like everybody else then, uh, you know, stands down to kind of your position. And that expectation creates less than the, the vulnerability and, and it keeps the superhero cape sort of on you. So, yeah. 
So, so what's beyond losing the superhero cape? So our, this brings us right to our next overarching behavior, basically, which is get all brains on deck. Right? Encourage people to innovate, to be creative at every level of the organization. <clears throat> it's your job to step back and foster this creativity. Right. So one of the ways of looking at this is imparting to your team the idea that not only do we want you to think critically, um, it's your duty. Uh, it's, it becomes, it should become expected. And if we make it safe and make it expected at the same time, well, things will start happening. It won't be only the luxury of a few holding the, you know, the world up like Atlas. Um, mm -hmm. When, when you can actually, you know, access all the brain power the, of the of the resources of the people in the company. I shouldn't have said the word resources. I've been fighting for years not to say it. Oh. Yeah. We all fall back into old patterns. Yeah. So I mean, the cool thing about this this one too, critical thinking, is that you know, um, I came out of the corporate world. One of the companies I worked for was Hewlett Packard, and we had three hundred twenty thousand employees. And at one point, we had a group called HP Labs, and they created the printers and the servers. And I actually was in IT and also in software development. Um, but we, what we're getting at here is that that those organizations may think, oh, labs is the only place that does the actual thinking, right? The innovation and creativity. And the truth of the matter is, is that most creativity in a lot of organizations happens when you take incremental things and you add it to new knowledge and then you create something new. And it's usually a smaller ongoing process, which could easily happen in the bowels of IT from a process standpoint, from a people standpoint, from a technology standpoint. So it's a mindset to Daniel's point of it's, I mean, we use the word duty of all, but really it's like show up and it's like, no matter what your job is in what part of an organization, you all have an opportunity to really bring your best selves to work, which is that that thoughts of innovation and creativity, adding adding incremental to new thoughts to create new process. And maybe even get to uh, one point, one of those increments might create that disruptive innovation that we're after, right? But yeah. you'll never know if you don't uh, start uh, spreading around the ability to, uh, to apply critical thinking. I think one of the greatest examples, I have a sticky pad in front of me and people probably know this, but these are from 3M, right? And it's like this concept of this like, you know, sticky, unsticky thing was actually a mistake. Was. They kept getting like iterated and grown. And now it's like, we all love those things, but it's like the idea is, you know, incremental with new thought creates potentially even disruptive. So pretty powerful. 3M Post has single-handedly enabled the agile industrial complex. <laughs> Everybody loves those Post-its, yes. <laughs> My backlog has all post-its. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We even, we, uh, even the virtual tools all have posts. I know it, right? Uh, bringing us to our next point, right? So how do you, how do you start eliciting that, that you know, and encouraging that innovation and creativity? Well, don't tell in the same way as you shouldn't speak last. Even if you do speak last and you're still telling, well, you've only got half the recipe and half the recipe is no recipe because you take the cake out of the oven and it collapses. So you have to ask open-ended questions, right? These are known as powerful questions in the coaching world, but these are questions that can't be answered by yes or no, and that make the people around you and the people you're asking these questions of think. And it's not Socratic questions either, by the way. I've, heard, I've seen that, um, that confusion. Socratic questioning is leading questioning. It's uh, you know the stuff that lawyers are made out of. So don't confuse the two. Open-ended questions and Socratic questions are not the same. The three M post-its that Karen just referred to is exactly that. But in addition, you know, that's a that's a famous that's a famous example. But one thing we want to highlight here is how can you make mistakes if you're going to be punished for them? All right. So psychological safety comes back to the right to make mistakes. Um, not the same mistake three times in a row. That would stretch the boundaries pretty much anywhere. But uh, <laughs> making honest mistakes in the pursuit of innovation and creativity, we have to build that in. 
um, we have to learn from our mistakes and share the learnings so that other people in the organization can avoid making the same mistakes so that you get to the point where organization-wide, the same mistake is not possible twice because you learn about it once somewhere and you disseminate that learning. I don't know if you had anything to add to this particular since, since a few since a few years there is also this fashion of uh, saying we have to celebrate celebrate failures and mistakes. I think mm -hmm. it's very important that male organizations give only lip service to this. You know, uh, the real thing is about when there is a, a failure, we requalify it as a success because there is a learning that has that has that has happened. So we have to actually have a way to uh, to give value to learning the organization. When we talk about a learning organization, is what it means. It means that we are uh, taking all these things, these, these little failures into account in a, in, in a form of progress or in form of value. That can also be brought to the extreme too. I don't know if you've any have heard the probably apocryphal story about Jim Watson, the founder of IBM, one of his VPs had launched an initiative that failed and it was a 10 million dollar hole in the bottom line so the executive goes with his resignation letter to jim watson and jim watson tears it up and says are you crazy i just spent 10 million dollars on your education <laughs> it's a great story so yeah. really you know one thing to add just to this though is is on top of it is that we as humans are very sort of tender sensitive uh ego driven beings right and so this the, the language that we use around this is very important and cultural, right? So if we say the word, hey, you failed, uh, Daniel, as opposed to one of the other terms is, you know, it's like learning, you can replace failure with learning, but you can also use words, if we borrow from Simon Sinek, things like falling, you know, if you fall as a person, you don't, you don't not get back up, you get up. Right. And you're Dust like, what did I trip off. on or what happened? <laughs> you know, you keep going. Right. And it's like it's this it's this way that we in engage and support one another on this journey of, you know, making some mistakes as part of being a person and a human. And when we're awkward and uncomfortable, that's when our brain is actually learning and growing and being able to to embrace that and make that a safe space is truly an important part of like innovation and creativity and back to this slide like you know getting people at all levels engaged um to to contribute and to create you know new things for their team and for their company so let's let's put this into uh into uh high gear now our third overarching behavior is make constructive dissent the norm Right. We've already touched upon the fact that speaking up uh, should not require an act of career limiting courage. Right? So the, the first thing to think about here is if there is a fear of speaking up, it is probably a sign of something somewhere in the culture being dysfunctional. And it's, it's that simple. And this goes back to Edgar Schein in 1965, the first one to have coined with Warren Bennis, the whole concept of psychological safety. He talked about fear. Deming back in 1982 said it's manager's job to drive fear out of the organization. So this is, this is far from new. This is, this is we're talking back the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. Hmm. So that fear of speaking up, you have to replace it. You have to replace it with basically creating the social norm. And you can model this social norm going back to modeling vulnerability. You know, when we model something, it means that we're actually, we're, we're, we're engaging in a behavior as a demonstration to others of what type of behavior we're trying to elicit. And uh, in fact, in, 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 in Dolly Chug's work, who's talked a lot about biases, Karen, you may, you, you may recall that um, she says that even when it comes to biases, um, speaking up has been proven to reduce um, the manifestation of those biases in the people expressing them if someone spoke up, future occurrences, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty important a point that you're bringing up there about speaking up. Um, it takes some courage, but um, what we use in a lot of coach coaching circles when people are having emotion, if they can 
if they can name it, you can tame it. If you can label, hey, what's coming up um, and feel safe to talk about it, then people are not making up stories in their mind. And this, this is another, since we're talking about people, Brene Brown's term shitty first draft, which our brain is totally full of problem solving. And without data, it will make it up. Um, so if you label it and you put it out there and you say, this is what's happening, um, then, then the brain says, ah, I've got, I've got data and I've got, I've got a, a, a breadcrumb or a point of, of connection so that I'm not going to fill in the blank with something that's, um, that's my story that may or may not be right. And it's, it's funny you should mention that because, you know, asking someone to name the emotion they're feeling is actually an open questioner as opposed yeah. to, I bet you're feeling sad right now. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's Socrates. a little leading, isn't it, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, or Socrates. You would, like... you, would you not agree that it is a good time to feel sad? Right. <laughs> okay, that's well, even... Let's that's... model some anti-patterns here. Yes, that... I couldn't repeat that if I tried. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we make constructive dissent part of the process? Right? There are some practices... Um, Karen, you had some good suggestions around uh, sort of the devil's advocate uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, anything that creates a, a process that allows you, I mean, we can borrow something from Salesforce called V2Mom, which is vision, values, methods, obstacles, and measures. And the O is the key thing that I want to dig into because bringing up obstacles in the spirit of a discussion um, if it's part of the process, then it doesn't put some one person in the middle of like, oh, hey, you know, I'm I'm negative or I'm bad or I'm always the one bringing up something. Um, so it takes away some of that scariness and it makes it more part of the culture and the norm of that team, um, which then, you know, that's that feels safer um, as opposed to almost back to the beginning comment we had about starting small and and one person at a time people be triggered in an organization in a team and so if you can eliminate having one person or you know singling people out and in this case my example is make it part of the process so there's not one person that's responsible or that always brings something up and then starts to develop a brand or a label around you know I'm I'm negative or I'm the bad person or what have you. So I believe that the, the practice of having, for example, dragon committee is something simple that can also help to, to uh, progressively uh, let this culture of dissent emerge, whether it's like a, a small, uh, I would say, practice and, and even ceremonial about, about how to express uh, um, uh, constructive uh, uh, criticism. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that I've used uh, and I found very helpful is uh, it's, there's a liberating structure and you, for those of you not familiar you can look those up but one of them is called TRIZ T-R-I-Z and basically you can gamify it the the, the goal of a, a TRIZ um, exercise is to basically as a group come up with every single thing we would need to do in order to make this initiative an, an abject failure and that's kind of funny because people go, you know, they, their imaginations go wild. But then the second question you ask is, well, how much of this are we actually doing right now? And then that's a group sort of, you know, it creates a group awareness and it distributes. Um, again, to your point, Karen, not making one person always be the, uh, you know, right. the bearer of bad tidings or whatever. And the final piece we wanted to talk about here is, support the, the second person in the vulnerability loop. Yeah, so this is, I mean, back to the example of, let's say, you know, we're using V2Mom or Tris or, or what, what devil's advocate or something, right? It, it, it's the first person that speaks up that has the courage to do that. But they also set the example of if the second person, the leader, the rest of the team, what have you, embraces that dissent now we're off to the races now we've created a situation where people are like ah it's safe like this is okay i can i can do this if 
the person responds or the team responds in a way that says, you know what, we'll put that in the parking lot. I know we've talked about that. We're going to use this feed to mom thing, but we don't have time, blah, blah, blah. Right. All these other reasons why that, that it's not okay to come up with constructive dissent. That's when things break down. That's when we're in that triggered fight, flight, or freeze zone. And the back part of our brain, our amygdala, the, the, the emotional part is now in charge of everything. And the front part of our brain, which is the executive process, has gone offline. Um, and I'm being chased by a tiger, metaphorically. And we're not doing it again. Like, I'm never speaking up again. Even though we said we had a process, it doesn't really matter because we're not going to follow it. So this second person in this concept of this vulnerability loop is super important. And so we bring it up because it's important just to get that thought into your brain about if we're going to agree to this as a team, then we need to embrace it. And once person speaks up, the second person has to really say thank you and, and mean it. There, there's a video I saw once on, on YouTube, isn't it? There, there's this guy dancing outside at a sort of outside uh, festival and he's dancing really weird and everybody's sort of looking at him. And at one point, you know, someone else comes and starts dancing with him and then that's it. You know, people start flocking and they just needed that second person to dance as crazily as he was to turn it from weird to uh, a movement. <laughs> It's a great, it's a great, see, it's the feeling, right? That's what that controls us. And it's a feeling of it's okay. The second person joins that other person dancing and pretty soon people are like, eh, I guess it's okay. It kind of looks like fun. I kind of wanted to do it anyway, but I didn't want to be them there now. It's awkward. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, Come on, Bruno. Uh, do a little spin there. <laughs> okay there you go he supported the vulnerability chain oh my god we're going to cut that in editing all right this is the studio <laughs> album version no just kidding mm -hmm. all right so this brings us pretty much we we promised a very short very uh to the point um uh, presentation here these are obviously you know we we didn't you know drag this out of our own imagination solely it's our experience in the field but also you know all these these thought leaders and authors and practitioners who obviously came before us and here are the contacts look us up in terms of uh you know if you want to pursue this uh if you're interested in pursuing this uh, get in touch with us and uh, at this point i think we have some questions now this being the studio album version we captured questions from the live presentation which we're going to answer again now so bruno drum okay. roll for the questions Yes, we had a, a few questions in the live webinar that are very, uh, very relevant to the topic. So we're going to cover them now. The first one, any tips on how we enable psychological safety to cross organizational boundaries, for example, when delivering a project for a challenging client? Mm -hmm. uh, and that I remember was from Matt. So, you know, the first thing to think about that is, in my experience, you know, as there's a as a, a business owner, I've actually uh, fired clients, not me, but I, I have fired clients because basically um, it was just too taxing. They were just, mm, it was not safe. I could feel it. So that's, let's, let's transpose that idea, that idea to a larger organization. If you are an organization that has client-facing personnel and business services personnel, for example. Uh, you can't have two classes of employees, two classes of contributors. You can't have people in the front lines serving clients being exposed to toxicity um, and psychologically unsafe uh, places and workplaces, uh, and at the same time offer better conditions on the inside where you've got better control because ultimately, if you're tolerating lack of safety in one part of the organization, it becomes the norm elsewhere. You're only as good as the worst behavior or the worst behavior from clients that you tolerate. So um, set a rule that what goes on inside is also valid for you know client-facing uh, personnel and uh, be ready to pull them or be ready to renegotiate with the client or, or even walk away, but don't make two classes of citizens. You're sending the wrong message. And it can be difficult, and you may have to have some difficult conversations with clients 
um, but you can't allow that to, uh, you know, to, yeah. to last. To I go think on. just just to build on that too, and, and to leverage kind of one of the, the things we shared with you all about, you know, the last point about you know it shouldn't be an act of reckless courage to speak up. Mm -hmm. If you have a working agreement, if you have a team working agreement that actually calls out like obstacles, i.e. the V2 mom thing we just talked about, this would be an obstacle. So this would be a real opportunity for the team to collectively say, how are we going to handle that? And if it's a if it's a remote client calling on a customer service line, it's tough to tell. But if it's an agreement with, you know, a client that you're servicing on Glowing, um, it seems to me like there's no reason they shouldn't be included in a part of that working agreement that team agreement um that shares like this is how we interact this is how we object this is how we treat each other um so and then again it's the second person right so when that happens people speak up we have to enable and empower and embrace that person so that that becomes the norm to feel yeah. safe to say hey i'm having i'm having trouble with this situation and i need help mm -hmm. absolutely Makes perfect sense. Thank you. Uh, another question here from uh, Shankar. How do we handle others displaying superhero behavior? Yeah, that was a good question, uh, Shankar. So um, when it comes to that, I think if you, you could just continue to model. When you model a behavior, you model like for everyone, not just you know uh, the people that maybe report directly to you, but also to your peers. Right? So so if you're willing to shed the superhero cape and, and, and model behavior, uh, your peers should also be, you know, bear witness to that and see that. So you're, you're, you're modeling also a social norm for your peers or even for some, you know, above you in the hierarchy. And, uh, you know, if your behavior actually uh, in a polite and constructive way uh, makes them question you know, the values uh, of the superhero cape, um, then you continue doing that. Uh, in certain situations, you, you can, again, reuse the bonding one-on-one -on -one approach, yeah. right? You know, take the person out to, out to lunch or, you know, have to just do a virtual one-on-one -on -one meeting or find some way beyond email and, and to, uh, to just, um, you know, say, you know, I've noticed that uh, you're, you know, you take a lot of stress on and you like to be, uh, in, uh, feel in control. Uh, I personally, I'm on a journey to to move away from that. And we could discuss my, you know, my insights if you, if you would like, you know, you know Karen. Yeah, you I any... love that. I, I think that back to, to even to, to the beginning slide to Daniel that you talked about, it's like, it's interesting, you know, the superhero behavior is a lot of it comes from norms, right? And this self-imposed expectations that we talked about. Um, and having the courage to go first, which would be, let's pretend I'm the person that's the superhero cape. And Daniel says, hey, exactly what you're saying. You know, it's like, can we, can we get together? Can we go have a coffee or whatever? Um, and just his ability to wanting to empathize with me, it, it it doesn't mean that it's my true, you know, it's true. It, it's just, it's, it's being able to see the other side's point of view. Mm -hmm. And if he, he cares enough to listen for me to say, oh, I feel so much stress and I've got all these, uh, you know, obligations and, you know, the team's just not getting it done. And it's like, all of a sudden, it's a whole new open-ended mm -hmm. discussion around, he can now say, oh, I see how much pressure you put on yourself. What if we had the team help you or vice versa? And so pretty soon the cape starts to come off because it's safe and he's connecting with me one-on-one -on -one and he's empathizing. Because regardless of, you know, if I'm a manager, leader in a company, I'm still a human, right? I still, <laughs> underneath all of it, I, I still hurt and love and care just like everybody else. And so him connecting with me and making it safe for me to have a dialogue with him about what's going on for me is the first step in mm -hmm. taking that cape off. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're going to take uh, one uh, last question from Eva. 
many more for, for Karen, no disrespect, Daniel. Um, as a woman, if you are a leader in a male-dominated field, how do you go about establishing respect without losing the vulnerability aspect? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Daniel could probably answer this question too. So even though it's addressed to a woman, but <laughs> I know for me personally, I think that the hardest part about self-imposed expectations and taking that cape off is that it goes back to something we sort of talked about is labeling. And this is hard, right? But if I show up in a meeting where I feel passionate or, you know, and maybe in my way is that I might cry um, or I might have more emotions than maybe some of the men in the room. But if I'm able to actually say that up front and say, hey, I'm super passionate about this. I'm going to get emotional. You know, please don't don't label me as, you know, somebody that's too overly sensitive and I can't handle this because that's not where I'm coming from. You know, to be able to actually express that and share that with others. Now I've squelched that part of my brain that wants to make up the story, the shitty first draft about, oh, here we go again. You know, Karen is X, Y, Z. If you lay, if you label it, you, you know, you can tame it. You name it, you can tame it. Um, and I know that that's not easy, but that is, in my opinion, based on this, this question, Eva, um, one of the first things you can do to really just get everybody on the same page and take away all of those other thoughts people are having um, that they will have unless you do say, here's where I'm coming from and here's my intent. Um, that's my question. About the only thing I could add actually is, um, and I'll, I'll address this to, to the men in the audience. Right? As men, we have the tailwind. Uh, unfortunately, that's the way it's been for up till now. We had the tailwind helping us along. Of uh, There is an advantage in this society to simply being a man. Mm -hmm. And that is the crude truth. And you can count up, and that's called ordinary privilege. And we, we can't even see it. We're like, you know, we're like fish in water. And someone asks, how's the water? And the other fish goes, what's water? Right? So <laughs> we don't even see it. But you can use... Um, you can widen your awareness and be an ally uh, of women and, and anyone um, who is othered in any way. You can use that privilege, see their headwinds and use your tailwinds to help them that's without. Beautiful. And you don't need to use sympathy. That's condescending. And you can't use empathy because you don't really know. Uh, so what you can use is just a commitment to learning and having the courage to be that second person. If you see a woman or you know any other uh, othered, um, any member of any othered, so to a certain extent, uh, uh, you know, a grouping of people, step up, step up. It's yeah. awesome. Thanks a lot, Daniel, Karen, and uh, the, the last answer was incredibly inspiring and refreshing to me. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Like, uh, I will keep that in my mind for a long time, I think, as a man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is how we end our little webinar today. Uh, I hope that we, uh, you enjoyed that as much as we do. We did, Daniel, Karen, and I. And uh, you can also um, download the slides and maybe find more resources in the link that will be in the description of this video so we can you can also contact us on linkedin for example we'll have always happy to continue the discussion with people who are passionate about this topic topic and leadership in general so thank you and have a great day thank you thank you all